Welcome to the BBB National Programs podcast, Better Series, where we will explore top of mind topics and self regulation with business and industry leaders. Together, we seek to understand the leading trends and innovations that continue to push the envelope in today's marketplace. Thank you for joining us today on the Better Series podcast. I'm James Lee. One of the biggest business stories of the past 10 years is the rise of the so called gig economy. What began as a way for people to pick up a second or third job in the wake of 2008's Great Recession turned into a full-fledged phenomenon driven by technology. Once unknown startups, Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, have since become household names and their valuations have exploded. But as is so often the case, with rapid explosive growth, it's followed by headline-grabbing growing pains. In the case of these gig economy companies, those growing pains have involved significant criticism for their employee policies and intense regulatory scrutiny. As the number of gig workers has grown, so have calls for companies who hire these freelance workers to offer more benefits and compensation to make them look more like full-time employees and less like independent contractors. In 2019, California took the step to redefine what it means to be a gig worker in a law known as AB5 which requires most gig workers to be reclassified as employees. As you can imagine, the companies built on the concept of a gig economy are not fans of AB5 or the court rulings that have so far backed the law. But what may be surprising is the number of gig workers who are also not happy with the California law or talk of expanding it across the country. Joining us today to discuss the state of the gig economy is independent journalist Philip Carity, himself a gig worker, who has written on the unintended consequences of making gig workers full-time employees. Philip, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Well, I guess we should start out by stating some of the obvious, that the COVID-19 pandemic has sort of changed the tone and tenor of this debate a little bit, and even the direction. But before we get to that, let's define what a gig worker was prior to AB5. What what have we always thought of as being a gig worker? Okay, so a gig worker is mostly just an independent contractor. And uh, before AB5, you could guess that the most visible uh, interpretation of a gig worker would be someone who works on a platform like Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Handy, One of those apps where you can just easily access what you need. But AB5 has kind of changed the definition for uh, what's permissible in terms of employers hiring independent contractors versus full-time workers. So if you look before AB5, you had something called, in California, it was called the Borello test. Uh, And that was sort of the law of the land in terms of when it was legal to employ an independent contractor and when it wasn't. And what that test said was it it laid out a bunch of factors, 13, that courts could consider to determine whether someone was legally employed as an independent contractor. The effect of that was that it it was fairly easy to work around. And a lot of these gig economy apps that we all know and use hired a bunch of lawyers and were able to craft kind of legal workarounds that allowed them to develop these vast workforces of gig workers. So that gave rise to Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, all those companies that we know and use. So one of the things that you you, you mentioned there is independent contractors. Now that historically is, that's been a really broad category. So that included exactly. things like, like your accountant, your lawyer, your, you know, your gardener. I mean, you right. know, uh, independent contractors was a, was a really big definition. So has, is this conversation around gig economy? Are we still talking about people in those kinds of jobs too? Or is it, are we strictly talking about somebody who's paid through an app? Yeah, so good question. And that's part of why this law is so controversial. In some ways, we are talking about both. The law was certainly aimed for people who are using the these platforms for work. But part of the reason why it's so controversial is because it wound up roping in so many people who were just going about their business as freelancers or you know independent contractors. People who, if you ask them, they probably wouldn't say, they were a gig worker. They would say, you know, I'm a freelance writer or 
I'm a freelance photographer, or whatever it might be. And there are other protections in the law for, for people who say if they have an LLC, the laws are a little bit different. But it's true that AB5 has kind of, a lot of people woke up one day after this law passed and said, oh, wait, I am a gig worker. If you take that, that broader definition that now apparently AB5 is, is supporting, what's the practical pe- effect of that for a business? So are, are now uh, businesses having to reclassify more than just the delivery drivers? They're having to look at, as you said, freelance photographers or freelance marketing people. Now, now they have to be classified as employees. And it, what's the practical effect of that? Yeah. I mean, in some cases, they are having to take a a hard look of who is on their payroll and whether it's legal. So we went from that 13-factor test called the Borello test, which was pretty easy to kind of work around and craft in your favor to be able to hire who you want when you want through pretty much whatever platform or service you want, to now post AB5 when employers are looking at something called the ABC test. And that is a three-part test that makes it very clear in terms of whether uh, an employer's relationship with an independent contractor is legal or not. So businesses are looking primarily at, at these three factors, which are whether the worker is free from their control in actually doing the work. Uh, whether the work that they're commissioning is outside the usual course of their business, and whether the worker who they're hiring is customarily engaged in an established trade of the same nature as the work being performed. That's kind of legalese, but the effect is how much control does the employer have over the worker? Uh, And if they fail any part of this three-part test, then they have to step back and reevaluate their relationship with the employer. So for example, a lot of publishers and creative freelancers were taken by surprise to see that this part of the law applied to them. Um, because when you consider the second part of the test, the work is outside the usual course of the employer's business. Well, a newspaper commissioning a, a story from a writer, that's very much part of the usual course of the of their business, but at the same time, it's sort of standard in that field. There's there's no way around that short of writers and, and freelancers losing a lot of work and publishers not being able to tap, you know, a, a vast pool of freelance workers. So that's sort of the three-part test that employers are looking at uh, and freelancers are looking at too to understand whether, whether, whether they're covered Uh, whether they need to do things like set up an LLC to protect themselves and whether they need to perhaps make new plans altogether, maybe even consider a move outside of California. Take one more step back for a second. What is, uh, and and you have personal experience in this, uh, what is the advantage of being a a gig worker? Yeah, so the advantage of being a gig worker is that you can work when you want. You can work where you want. You can work as much or as little as you want. Technically, you're free from the control of your employer, so they can't really dictate any of those things to you. You don't have to answer to them necessarily, um, at least in terms of how, where, or when you do the work. There are other reasons. Uh, Gig work has opened up a lot of opportunity for people who need work that's supplementary to their main income stream. So if they just want to work extra nights or weekends, it's a backup for some people in case they lose their full-time work. In other cases, let's say you're a young budding graphic designer and you want to build up a client base. Well, you may turn to one of these gig platforms like Fiverr, for example, um, which allows people to just easily, easily access and hire creatives on a project basis. Um, and that could be a good way to get gain traction in your field. Um, so, so it is worth noting that for all the controversy around gig work and for all the sort of the, the talk about gig workers being exploited, that a lot of gig workers actually choose to be gig workers. And I think a lot would tell you that they prefer it that way. I think we used to refer to those people as entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. That in some in some cases, yes. The advantage to a business on 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 the other side of that equation, the advantage to a business is what? If you're hiring a gig worker, it's very different from hiring a full time employee. First of all, you can do it faster. So you get kind of like labor when you need it. You get the labor that you need at cost, meaning you're just buying, you're buying, if you're hiring a graphic designer, you're just buying the design. You're not buying an employee that you're going to have to carry for how, who knows how long uh, and pay all kinds of benefits and taxes associated with that person. So it's more flexible access to labor it's more dynamic. There are tax advantages. Um, and especially if it's some, in some cases, you're able to tack into a more skilled and dynamic workforce of people because it's customary in that trade to be a gig worker, like, for example, writers and designers and photographers. You may end up with a better final product if you tap someone who's a, a real gig worker specialist uh, than if you just use someone who's staff. Well, it, it sounds like in this case, uh, if you apply that ABC test, there are a number of skills that you're going to find a gig worker that you're not going to run afoul of that test. You know, if your business is selling widgets and you're not hiring a gig worker to make widgets, you're hiring them to create the marketing piece or something that helps you sell or manufacture the widgets, but they're not doing it. You might, you might actually not run afoul of this law. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, there's still going to be a big market for gig workers and there will still be demand. But what you're describing is sort of a legal sniff test that employers will want to do before they hire anyone who's working on a 1099. What's been the effect inside California to the degree that you know that it, we know at this point, because you know, the law is not that old, it's still working its way through a, a lot of legal challenges, but has there been a, a practical effect inside the state of California? Yes. Um, so first of all, there's just kind of the general fallout from the passage of the law. Um, it ins- unsettled a lot of employers and workers. For example, all those people like we talked about earlier, who woke up one day and, and realized they were being roped into this gig economy legislation when they just considered themselves freelancers, for example. But it's also, the net effect is that it's made it very difficult to hire gig workers in California. Um, and it's also become something of a liability in the eyes of a lot of employers. So, for example, one, one of the, mo- the most widely reported Uh, events after the the law passed was when Vox, which is a big media company, cut some 200 or so freelance writers from their payrolls because they said this this just is too risky for us. It didn't comply with the law anymore. So you're seeing opportunities kind of shrink for gig workers. You're seeing a lot of legal challenges to the law. Um, You're seeing a ballot initiative led by Uber, Lyft, Uh, and a few other gig platforms to try to overturn the law. But then, you know, you are also seeing moves, for example, by Uber to try to accommodate maybe some of the complaints of policymakers and advocates for gig workers by taking steps to make sure that drivers on their platform have full control over their work for, by example, being able to set their their price for their rides or by being able to screen where a rider wants to go before accepting a ride and you know accepting or declining accordingly based on whatever they desire Um, and you're seeing those efforts so that these companies and these gig platforms can say you know hey our workers really are free from our control you know they're independent workers they're like you said functioning almost as you know, entrepreneurs in a way, like going about their own business, just happen to be doing it on our platform. Is it having an impact outside of California yet? Or is everybody just kind of looking at it warily saying, oh, I hope that doesn't come here? Yeah, No, it's it's definitely having an impact. Um, For one, a lot of out of state 
employers. So a lot of, you know, obviously there are national companies who do business in every state. They're having to carve out special policies just for the freelancers or the gig workers that they employ in California, Uber included. And then there's the there's copycat legislation that's kind of making its way through other state houses, Oregon, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, among them. And it's also worth saying that some of the backlash against this bill has been heard by the architect of the the law and and some other folks in the California State Assembly. Um, And they have taken steps to address, for example, what we discussed about freelance writers Uh, and journalists, uh, there is a proposal to amend the bill to exclude them. So hopefully, even if this copycat legislation does go through in other states, it comes through, you know, a little bit more refined, having having seen what played out in California. Um, But but it is kind of percolating in other states. And then there's even uh, a federal proposal to incorporate AB5 text, basically that ABC test that we talked about, into something called the the PRO Act, Protecting the Right to Organize Act. So it is having an effect outside California. It's stirring a lot of debate. Uh, A lot of employers are eyeing it. Um, And overall, just kind of exercising more caution, consulting more with labor lawyers, making sure that they are uh, not exposed because, uh, you know, another thing that kind of came out of this, what birthed the AB5 test was this lawsuit called Dynamex in California. And it found that employers were retroactively liable for wages and, and benefits and such that were not paid to the plaintiffs in that case. A lot of employers do need to be looking at these laws very carefully to make sure they understand the risks and if these, if there are similar laws or rulings and or whatever it might be in other states, they might be exposed to legal liabilities down the line. Before we wrap up, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the fact that in the midst of a global pandemic, this has also become a national discussion because as we're talking about how to, you know, keep the economy functioning, there's been a lot of discussion around gig workers who don't have protections they don't have a, they don't qualify for unemployment in normal times they don't have the other kind of safety net benefits because they're not considered employees how is this going to impact this discussion uh, in the in the debate about how to treat gig workers you know i think it's going to bring the discussion it's going to swing the pendulum back to the middle a little bit uh, recently it kind of really swung in favor of the gig worker with ab5 gaining steam. But we're seeing that, you know, when during a downturn, when there's millions and millions of unemployment claims, gig work is actually a pretty attractive alternative to a lost job or or even a lost gig job in another sector uh, because the barriers to entry are so low and it's really responsive to demand. For example, there's a lot of need for uh, grocery delivery people right now. Uh, and and apps, gig apps, are a great way to redirect some of the labor force into those areas that are needed. But you are seeing sort of a broad recognition that, you know, these people are essential in many ways, but they really don't have a safety net to fall back on. So there's also been some progress in that regard because the CARES Act that Congress just passed kind of takes the unprecedented step of making sure that gig workers and freelancers or sort of, or sort of non-traditional full-time workers have access to unemployment benefits whereas during previous downturns that was just not the case you could only seek unemployment benefits if you were laid off from a full-time job and then it's also sparking some debate around you know should these should employers really be responsible for workers' benefits in the first place and their health care and, and all those essential things that, that you think of, like you know, workmen's compensation and, and you know, access to, to a retirement plan? Maybe those are things that should be a little less tied 
to one specific employer, whether that's, you know, provided through the state or even just portable benefits that gig workers could kind of take with them from gig to gig or platform to platform that multiple different employers could pay into. So there's a lot of recognition that these people need the benefits uh, and there's a lot more discussion around potential solutions to make gig work more sustainable in the long term. Well, thank you, Philip, for joining us today to bring some perspective to this issue. I know it's one among many we'll be watching for quite some time to see how this actually plays out. So thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And thank you for listening to the BBB National Programs Better Series. Don't miss an episode by subscribing at our website, bbbprograms.org. Click on the podcast tab and hit the subscribe button. You'll find all of our episodes there where you can listen on your Apple Podcast app iHeartRadio, or your favorite streaming platform. You just enjoyed the Better Series podcast. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To learn more about our other shows, visit betterbusiness.blueberry.com. That's betterbusiness.blubrry.com. Follow us on Twitter at BBB underscore NTL programs. Send your comments and ideas to podcast at BBBNP.org. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB national programs or its affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Blueberry's Terms of Service.